Thank you all so much for attending. If you missed our last webinar on using research to reinvent the on-demand tutoring model, please take 30 minutes and check it out at tutorwithpearl.com forward slash webinars. At Pearl, we believe that high impact tutoring is the clear evidence-based winner on how to best address the many challenges our students are facing related to learning loss. In the beginning of September, we all heard about the NAEP scores. They were all over the news. Naturally, nearly two years of learning loss due to COVID has created a score gap. Many specialists will tell you that NAEP scores are a difficult gauge to take specific action on, but that does not mean that the scores themselves are not significant. If policymakers are ready to make it a talking point, let's ensure the programs that come from their aggressive funding reactions reliably help our students succeed. In this webinar, I'm going to give you a quick history and background on the NAEP test, review the 2022 national, stat national status, and look at how the individual states fared. I'm going to talk about policymaker responses, chat a bit about how we can influence, influence policymakers towards evidence. And lastly, I'll cover data categories that education leaders should optimally collect and organize to submit or launch and maintain their program. NAEP stands for National Assessment of Educational Progress. The NAEP test has been part of American life since the 60s when the Commissioner of Education, Francis Keppel, decided that there needed to be a standard way to measure current national grade school progress, especially knowledge, skills, and abilities using a valid standardized assessment. Before this change, actually, a lot of the way our grade student progress was monitored at the federal level happened via input variables like attendance, cost per student, and classroom capacity. It was really under Keppel that it was made clear that output data or performance and percentile metrics should be used to more accurately judge progress. Since the 1960s, a lot of different people have been involved as contributors to the evolution of the NAEP test, including state and district education officials, contractors, policymakers, consultants, students, teachers, and of course, the research community. Side note, this is actually kind of interesting. Standardized testing at the individual state level has been part of the K-12 experience since the mid 1800s but was really not mandated by the federal government as in each state needs to give a state-based assess based assessment until no child left behind, which started in 2002. Today, under ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, the states have a lot more autonomy regarding education standards, which is why we now actually have one state, Nebraska, that does not give a standard state test. The test is given to a randomized group of fourth graders and eighth graders in all 50 states. In total, we're talking about somewhere around 450,000 students across 10,000 schools or so. And it covers both math and reading on a scale of zero to 500. As you've all heard, this year's scores were pretty bad. But I think that in many ways, we were all expecting to see a strong national drop because of COVID. That being said, scores have been in decline over the years prior to COVID as well. Actually, both math and reading scores have been heading down nationally since 2012. So let's talk about math versus reading. Reading progress is difficult skill. It's a difficult skill to place fully on the shoulders of our schools and teachers. So much of how well kids learn to read is based on home life. Were they read to as a baby? Were books around? Were books even being read by the parents? Math, on the other hand, is most often, but not always in the hands of the teachers. Math skills and knowledge are most often foundational. With the right scaffolding and basic math, students are afforded the necessary foundations to progress into higher math subjects. Across the nation, we saw pretty devastating results from both fourth graders and eighth graders in both math and reading. There was a three-point decline in average reading scores for fourth and eighth grade compared to 2019, which was the last time the test was administered. Math scores were even worse, with fourth graders decreasing by four points and eighth graders decreasing by eight points. The eighth grade math slide is particularly scary as that it is a critical transition point to higher math like algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Also, compared to 2019 NAEP scores, 
the new scores had quite a few more students scoring what is called below basic, which means that they are much more likely to have poor oral reading fluency and word reading skills. As is sadly almost always the case, the NAEP scores also revealed a much more significant decline for students that were already performing poorly and in devastating areas of the country, particularly amongst communities of color with generational inequities in place, the scores outlined an ever deepening divide. Fourth grade math declined in every state with reading scores declined in 30 states. The scores with the steepest math declines included Delaware, Virginia and DC, followed by New Mexico, New York, and Maryland, which each lost 10 points on average. Fourth grade reading declines were not as bad as math, with Virginia at negative 10, followed by Delaware at negative 9, and DC, Idaho, Oklahoma, and West Virginia at negative 8 each. Keep in mind that these are decline numbers, not scores, with some states starting with pretty low numbers from 2019. Nonetheless, the 2022 fourth grade reading scores were on average the lowest scores we've seen since 2015. Eighth grade math scores were the most alarming across the board, with more than a third of the students scoring below the basic level. This is a 7% increase to the below basic average. The largest declines on the eighth grade math assessment were in Oklahoma at negative 13, Delaware and West Virginia at negative 12, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania at negative 11. Again, this is super scary as kids that are significantly behind at this point in their education progress may never be exposed to higher math, which will significantly decrease the probability of them entering into jobs in science or tech. Similar to what we saw in reading versus math scores in fourth grade, eighth graders fared quite a bit better than read in reading. Most of the country kept pretty similar reading average scores on, or improved slightly compared to 2019. Exceptions included Maine that dropped eight points, Delaware, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Oregon dropped seven points, and then North Carolina, West Virginia, and Missouri, also Connecticut, declined six points. Now let's talk a bit about policy. Across the nation, governors or governors running for office at the time took this moment to either celebrate the fact that they had not lost much ground, pointing to opening schools early, or summer programs, or they berated their opponent saying that their opponent was failing students. In some states, there were announcements like Virginia, where a new program was revealed to partner HBCUs and the Urban League to supply additional tutoring to the state. In Delaware, House Bill 304 was signed, which mandates reading tests to be given three times a year to kindergarten through third grade to help identify reading deficiencies. In many ways, the news was just the political maneuver of the week either doubling down on current systems saying they are working or reinforcing the failures of past decision-making. Through all the fog of news and data, what rang true was that our students have not fared well and something has to be done. So we know that students are way behind. What can we do about it? First of all, we have to help create more individualized learning pathways. And we have to address the loss of academic progress with strategies we know work. Instead of continuously blanketing our districts with programs that are opt-in and frustratingly ineffective, we need opt-out academic support. If you're going to do on-demand homework help, make it opt-out and make it homework. Our students that are behind enough to need help with reading and math should be in true high-impact tutoring interventions that follow the National Student Support Accelerator's Tutor Quality Improvement System as closely as resources and logistics will allow. If these programs are going to be made sustainable, literally become part of the K-12 experience into the future, as I believe is an imperative, we have to start building better interoperability between our tutor data systems and district systems. And we have to start collecting the right data to improve our insights and thoughtfully supply our researchers and evaluation partners the information they need to show clear OR ROIs to funding sources. And that includes not only American Rescue Plan ESSER funds, but state funds, future education funding, and philanthropy. We, the education community, can influence our policymakers with evidence, with better scores based on tutoring programs that support our schools and bolster our success. 
Tutoring is the best scaffolding we can give our failing students today. It's not just about academic progress. It is about giving our students the personalized help that they desperately need. So I'd like to introduce you um, to a data stack that we are working with um, at Pearl and we are implementing for our partners. Now, some of this is in place and some of this is um, strategies that we are putting into place with our partners. If we are to provide the level of insights needed to truly, truly prove efficacy of a tutoring program, here are the key data types. We need personal data. It's the data we have about the students and also the data we have about other stakeholders like tutors and parents. We should have platform data like logs in the system that help us understand the behaviors of students and how they're interacting with the te technology and the content. Reporting data should be a combination of comprehensive post-tutor session reports, social emotional insights, surveys, pulse checks, and other types of qualitative inputs. A strong tutoring program should begin with diagnostic assessment and have at least a strong agile formative assessment strategy. Lastly, as we move into the future, the opportunity to create data from media when sessions are happening virtually is also critical. This includes using speech to text for transcription, sentiment analysis, micro expression, and on and on. The AI is becoming so incredibly compelling. Here we see how the tutor data can meaningfully overlap with other data categories, like district data and data about the community. There is also the opportunity to bring in additional insights from other data sources like state or national anonymized data as a way to better understand percentiles and how your program is standing up against other programs around the state or the nation. If you run a tutoring program, whether serving a small district or state education agency looking to work through grant funding to support those districts and schools. I'm telling you right now, there is a massive opportunity. The opportunity is to double down on what we know works and ensure that you are collecting the data to prove that your program worked via a third party evaluation, preferably a highly reputable academic institution. As we move into the next couple of RFP and grant cycles, funders will have more insights than ever to make decisions based on effectiveness, effectiveness rather than best guesses. Programs that have proven effective will not only become the leaders in tutoring, they will also be looked at as a beacon solution for sustaining positive academic support well into the future. All right. I am now going to take some questions. Um, the first question that I have is uh, from, I don't, I'm not sure the name here, but can you explain what you mean by opt-out programs? So opt-out, when a student has the ability to decide whether he or she is going to participate in academic support, there is strong evidence that shows that they typically do not opt in. So if they are already opt if they're already opted um, into the program and would have to opt out, the chances are much greater that they will participate. So one of the ways that our company is working with our partners to solve this is any chance we can to roster the students so that all of the students are participating in a program, then the academic support itself can live within the context of where they are at any time virtually. So if there's tutoring available, they can easily access that tutoring. Um, here's a second question in, um, can you explain a bit more about what you mean by media data? So when I talk about media data, I am talking specifically about the recordings of any tutoring sessions that are happening virtually. Now we have to be careful about data security. Consents are very important if we're gonna be using any of those videos for research, but ultimately there's opportunity to do what are called data transformations on that media 
and create new data. And that could just be what was said in the tutoring session. Can you identify what was said by one tutor and also by the student? Or if there's multiple students, can you determine who was speaking more versus another student? Um, there is the opportunity to do object character recognition where the AI would actually be able to give context based on what was being taught on the whiteboard within the, the tutoring session itself. Um, there is sentiment analysis. So you could, is someone angry or are they joyful? Um, can you determine what their sentiment is and, and based on the dynamics of how they speak or what language that they're using? Um, I, there's also a lot of new emerging tech um, around um, micro expression and being able to determine if someone's smiling or happy or unhappy. And all of that stuff can contribute to an anonymized set of data that can be really powerful as far as insights and in how our students are learning. So we're really excited about that work. It's very much in the early stages, but um, there's a, a lot to be done there. The next question is, um, do you place more or less emphasis on parent feedback given the age of the student? I feel like my middle school parents are nowhere near as engaged as my elementary parents. So in general, I think that there's a lot of really interesting work being done here. I know that Alex Cortez at um, Bellwether um, is doing a lot of work in this space looking at parent engagement. Um, there's uh, a couple of programs around the country where they're relying less on, you know, IEPs or the schools prescribing uh, tutoring, and they're going directly to the parents and asking the parents directly if they could um, be supportive. The data is pretty clear that when you have an engaged parent um, and that parent is reinforcing and making sure that attendance happen, that you're going to have much better um, outcomes. Um, that being said, I agree. I mean, I think once you get into later, like your middle school years, it's much more difficult for a parent, particularly to help with math. Um, but if they're behind in reading, the parent can be really supportive. Uh, and, and as much as we can, we have a parent portal. Um, we want to drive our parents to leverage that portal. Our portal allows for our parents to be able to see the scheduled sessions. It allows them to see the sessions that have occurred in the past. Um, all of our sessions were recorded so they can watch the recordings of those sessions. And as much as our parents are engaged, we really think that that helps the overall design of the program. Um, the next question is, uh, are, you, are there any um, commonalities amongst states who performed, underperformed in regards to the NAEP scores? I mean, this is a tough one. I looked at, um, I looked across the country, a lot of the states that, um, have sort of always traditionally performed pretty well, um, continued to perform pretty well. Good example of that is Massachusetts. Massachusetts has always um, done pretty well in general. And their scores, although they had a couple of instances where they had a little bit of a decline in certain counties, um, ultimately they, they didn't miss much um, in regards to the, the scores. Um, and then on the opposite end, you had states like um, New Mexico that have traditionally scored very, very low and across fourth grade and eighth grade, both math and reading, um, New Mexico had the lowest scores um, on, in each one of those categories. So I know um, both of those states have their own um, approaches to learning loss. Um, New Mexico has just implemented a new program. Um, for on-demand homework help, we'll see how well that performs for them. Um, but in general, you know, the states that were already performing poorly before COVID just saw much more, a much deeper um, um, dip than we would typically see for between tests. Um, in regards to resources, someone was asking about resources. Um, Obviously, we always um, point to the National Student Support Accelerator. There are so many great um, uh, tools that you can use on the National Student Support Accelerator website. Um, one is an actual district playbook that will allow you to kind of reference best practices in, regard in, in regards to um, implementing tutoring within your district. Again, I just can't help but you continue to harp on this idea that the more you can stick to the tutor quality improvement system, 
um, those standards will really help um, provide you with that infrastructure you need to perform um, tutoring in the way it should be performed. Um, in addition to that, there are other, um, there is a, the TQIS, um, there's a PDF that we can make available, um, easily available. You can find it easily on the National Student, Student Support Accelerator website, or you can um, easily just Google it and, and find it. Um, that those, that TQIS, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really cool because for each one of those design principles, um, there is the relative, you know, what is the emerging evidence? What evidence is there? Is there third party or has there been really like randomized control trials? How strong is the evidence for each one of those? And some examples of that would be, you know, learning um, in the school, learning in person, all of that drives better attendance, of course, using high quality materials, consistency of the tutor. These are all examples of things that we know work. And obviously having a consistent tutor as in the best world, you'd have that consistent tutor at least three times a week on the subject that they're behind on. Um, using uh, evidence-based processes and, and what we know about tutoring today that works, and then you know as much as possible collecting the data you need to prove that what you did um, was effective is how you're going to make your program sustainable into the future. You know, Pearl as a company is looking well beyond the American Rescue Plan ESSER cliffs, and we're saying, what does the world look like when tutoring is a part of the K-12 experience? And we're just big advocates for that as just a fundamental change across the country. So thank you so much uh, for attending today. Uh, we plan to make notes uh, the video and research related to today's webinar available to all of you. As we always do, we try to get that up within 24 hours. So if you've got friends or colleagues that missed today, we might think that we'll find, would find this uh, helpful, please um, send them the link. And if you're already planning to participate in serving government funding tutoring programs and are looking for a technical partner, an all-in-one platform to implement your program, please schedule a time uh, to chat with me via the link posted in the chat. Um, this will, link will also be sent out to everyone via email following the webinar. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and, and thank you all the educators on our, um, that uh, attended today or are watching this. We're really excited about the work that you're doing. I know it's tough, um, but keep up the good fight and we'll be there to back you up. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.